I will uh, meet myself, and uh, without further ado, here's Jonathan. Awesome. Well, thank you everybody for joining. The uh, as, as we've covered, my name is Jonathan Hawes. Uh, so who am I? I am, once this decides to actually interact properly, I am the head of security at QuantStamp. There we go. Uh, where I lead our audit practice. So QuantStamp is a blockchain security firm specifically focused on smart contract auditing. Uh, so I'm going to cover basically what auditing means in a bit and also sort of what smart contracts means because those are kind of loaded terms. Uh, previous to this, I've designed and implemented static analysis tools at multiple Fortune 10 companies. I've worked in a lot of places and spoken on a lot of things. Uh, do presentations on corporate risk management, CorpSec, insider threat, application security. Uh, but more importantly, I'm a hacker. Uh, I've made my career around running security assessments, doing pen tests, and uh, covering VRPs. So I helped run the VRP for Snap. Uh, I ran the VRP for NerdWallet. And I have ran VRP in some capacity or another uh, for multiple organizations over multiple periods of time. Uh, I think vulnerability rewards programs, more importantly, bug bounties as a whole, really demonstrate a lot of value for individuals. Uh, the numbers at the top are going to be off. And we're just we're just going to go with that. Uh, as the slide says, I like to break things, and I like to build the tools that do that. And that's exactly what I do at Quantstamp. And based upon that, I'm going to give you some more sort of information on how you as individuals who are interested in bug bounties, you as individuals who are interested in maybe what the scene holds, but not entirely sure about it, uh, can get a better understanding. So why smart contracts is a really good question. Um, smart contracts are code. I think that's the easiest way of viewing it. Uh, smart contracts are this way of doing trustless code. It, it's th These are programmed elements which remove the need for a third party. So if you're wanting to perform some behavior, uh, you can tell the contract to do it. Like You don't have to intervene if you're saying, want, I want to exchange money from here to here. The smart contract can do that. You can run very complicated business logic all on your own utilizing these smart contracts without intervening. Uh, there's no human intervention necessary that is incredibly powerful when you think of mediums of exchange. Say I wanted to give you something or you wanted to give me something. If we could do so without having to go through a bunch of complicated steps, like that's huge. So uh, we've got about $10 billion that's been raised or exchanged recently uh, via smart contracts from about 50,000 smart, or excuse me, 500,000 smart contracts in existence a year ago to over 5 million today, the interest levels have just grown uh, repeatedly. And these systems are decentralized. There's no centralization. It's not like a bank where you go in and they've got the ledger somewhere, you know, hidden in some data storage. Like these are decentralized. It's running on multiple people's computers. So it enables you to adopt technology uh, without, large scale human intervention. Humans are capable of not running through things, uh, which is why smart contracts have a, a lot of value to them. This, this premise of having the multiple nodes with duplicate information is huge because you don't have to trust one centralized party. Um, but there's a lot of room for improvement to say the very least. The increasing popularity of smart contracts has led to increased security risks. Uh, securing vulnerabilities in these smart contracts has sort of slowed down adoption because people have been writing really bad code. Um, and that's no fault of their own. The resources really aren't there to write good code yet. But what we do and what a number of other firms do as well is we find these vulnerabilities through a number of techniques. We use formal verification, fuzzing, and some manual inspection. Other firms are using, you know, partial, de uh, partial decompilation. Like there's a number of approaches that have been been found to be valid. There's a number of ways that we approach this, but what I'm going to cover is how you, an individual, can kind of get into this today and maybe make some improvement here. Our biggest belief is that this is a space that we definitely need more security researchers in. And while you know we we have people super skilled on like OWASP top ten, you know people who can look through CSRF every single day, not a issue. We'd like to expand that outward. We'd like to look at how 
can we get more people looking into smart contracts? How can we get more people looking into you know these these immutable bases of code? Um, so that that right there is is one of the big issues with smart contract usage is because the code base itself is immutable. So when you're thinking about utilizing a, a smart contract, it's not like a Java program or a C program where you can just you know go in throw it into your IDE, throw it into Vim and change it. it. It doesn't work that way. When you load a smart contract, that smart contract can then not be changed once you've published it to the blockchain. So you have to be able to write it very securely the first time you write it. So due to unchecked bugs over the last two years, that's where you're seeing 234 million USD was lost in Ether. We're talking about 34,000, now estimates, estimates are around 50,000 smart contracts that are found to be exploitable. And we're talking tons of money at risk. So for a, kind of a basis of why smart contracts are so exploitable and why things are so difficult, I think it's important for us to look at something that isn't smart contracts. So let's look at uh, Hello World in Python. Uh, anyone in the chat? Does, can, can you explain what this will do? I'll give you a hint. It prints hello world. It sounds super simple because frankly speaking, it is. When you're looking at other languages, they're relatively simplistic to read. There's no inherent huge difficulty in understanding how you know, Python works and how understanding C works. Yes, you're going to maybe have to understand some of the construct, but it's not going to be incredibly difficult because a lot of these languages are written in a technical manner, but like picking them up, there's guidelines, there's resources, it's easy enough. Now you Google Python, hello world, they'll tell you exactly what you need to run, exactly what you need to do. And it's not to say Solidity, which is the programming language that a majority of these Ethereum-based smart contracts are written in, isn't, uh, you know, necessarily simple, but it's it's definitely not as simple. So I, I've written a hello world in uh, in Solidity, but I decided to use the official Solidity hello world because I think it's a bit more interesting. So Solidity's official hello world is uh, this is part of it. So as you see here, in order to properly understand Solidity's hello world. Um, you need to be able to understand inheritance, uh, deployment of a contract, what the premise of a contract is, initialization of contracts, whether or not funds can be sent, greater variables, variables in general, access scopes, constants. It's not very easy to pick up. Um, and this is part of the problem we're seeing. When you've got tons of very, very interested people trying to look at how to engage in writing something as simplistic as a hello world, the fact that it's so inherently complex is a bit insane. Um, so and this is one of the things we're seeing. You know, We've got two contracts. We need to have an understanding of these contracts. And to begin even looking for flaws in these, we need to understand all this you know, verbiage. Now, we could go through and say, OK, well, you know, mortal sounds interesting. Well, let me, let me Google what message sender is. And I'll do that right now. And you'll see perhaps how complex things are. So we go to message sender. Message sender tells us, well, okay, there's a there's variable here. I can look at it. Okay, well, this doesn't give me it. Well, that gives me it. Okay, it means sender of the message, which is the current call. Now, to be able to go through these, you have to then be able to understand really complex nuances. The, the documentation, the code base here is just simply very complex. And again, we're talking about a simple hello world. So the fact that the hello world is giving us this much problem is, uh, it's, it's a bit absurd. So we then need to know a bit more. At this stage, we've only written the hello world. We still need to be able to take it, compile it into its application binary interface. So the ABI using Sol C, which is a Solidity compiler, look at the tree, see that it actually printed it out, create a greater factory at this point, then deploy it to the blockchain. So at this point, we've spent about probably an hour or two hours the, the font size is intentionally small on that specific element to kind of demonstrate the difficulty, uh, but I'll increase that a bit there. Um, uh, so what we're seeing, it's, it's, it's complex. It's very complex. Uh, and, and really speaking, for no good reason. 
the uh, yeah, there we go. Um, it, we're, we're just seeing a level of complexity that's kind of unheard of. Uh, it, it's it's not looked at in a way that's hey, this is accessible, this is easy to go to, this is something that makes sense. It simply isn't. Um, when you're looking at learning C or exploiting C, there's tons of documentation available. There's tons of details available on how to go about, you know, looking through return-oriented programming, looking through basic binary exploitation. And none of this really exists for Solidity and none of this really exists for Ethereum as a whole. So it gets us into this area of, well, how do I learn? And what I'd say is don't be discouraged. Again, we're on step three now of a hello world. We still need to actually deploy it. At this point, you've downloaded six different elements to your computer. You're still learning how to get through this. It's it's still being inherently super complex. Um, so it's difficult, but it's not impossible. And I want to encourage that because when we're looking at the next step I'm going to mention, you're going to see how individual bug bounty hunters who aren't familiar with the nuances of Solidity, aren't familiar with the nuances of Ethereum can really make a huge difference. So as I've talked about, the barrier to entry right now is very big. There are so many barriers. It's tremendously difficult to get documentation on how to do things. Security concerns are rampant because frankly speaking, there's no real good resource for these. The bugs we face on a day-to-day -day basis though aren't complex. And while simple errors can cost millions, for the most part, the big vulnerabilities we're going to be seeing aren't super difficult. We're not looking at things like cross-site request forgery, or XXE, we're not looking at any crazy esoteric vulnerabilities in which you're going to have to you know, do some rerouting of how the compiler works. It's fairly simple. It's looking at things like this. So this is a function within a contract. Now, here we've got a withdraw function that is given an unsigned integer. That unsigned integer then says, okay, well, I've got this require um, that is going to be within the first line. So we've got a function, we've got a, a variable type being sent to it, certain actions are being posted. Um, yeah, oh, the, yes, uh, the NAPS stack, that is, a, that is a fun Ethereum pwn, and I am mentioning that somewhere in here. In this function, can anyone see something wrong? I'll say require is basically a good way of testing whether or not something is true. Uh, and if it is true, the function is allowed to continue on. The unsigned uh, integer here is a potential issue in others, but not a huge issue here. The issue here is actually pretty simplistic. Um, as long as that initial balance is positive, you're capable of getting more out of it than you should. So even if uh, you know you wanted to withdraw on your second time uh, an amount that's going to exceed that, even if it's going to drain it, as long as that number is not zero, it, it's going to work. So I honestly see no, no race conditions in this one. Um, but the, the bugs you're seeing are pretty simplistic. When you go through these bugs, the actual vulnerabilities you're going to be looking at aren't inherently difficult. Um, a note of caution on this. It, it, it is with the UN, but not, not exactly. I see what you're saying, Red5. Um, again, like th th that bug isn't an inherently difficult one. That's one you'd expect to see in, frankly speaking, CS101. But the actual execution of it is far more um, you know, costly. That, that bug is, is hugely influential and, and bugs that we're going to cover in a bit are, are hugely uh, detrimental to, to writing secure code and solidity. So while the barrier to entry is really high, there's a number of ways in which you can learn more without an advanced knowledge of solidity. Beyond knowing what require was there, you really could have sort of discern most of that through your own research. Um, and many resources exist in order to automate some of these findings, but these are presented with a word of caution. So I'm gonna talk briefly about some of these tools you can use to go through and 
maybe make your life a bit easier. Um, but again, as with any tool, you know, we've, we've talked about Burp, we've talked about, uh, you know, Durbuster, we've talked about a lot of these tools that you can use to find security flaws. I, I will caution them as I would caution anything else. It's important to go through and be sure that you're using them for ethical purposes. So use them wisely, use ethically, and report flaws that you find. There's no difference between finding flaws here and participating in a bug bounty. In fact, many programs actually have bug bounties enabled for this exact reason. And it, you know, if you think there's a lot of low hanging fruit in the bug bounty industry, there is, especially when you're looking at smart contracts, because a lot of these individuals don't traditionally look at security. So let's see. Here's a good example. And while it is not the parity bug uh, that the Napstack mentioned, it is a similar bug uh, in terms of impact to the community. So there was a recursive call vulnerability. This is a concept known as re-entrancy, which we're gonna cover in a second. Um, here is July 12th. So, you know, a research paper came out, an individual said, hey, this bug is totally going to be vulnerable to smart contracts with how things are written right now. In fact, on the way it's written as at this time, this is problematic. Mind you, the individuals here said they were a smart contract expert. They weren't actually a security expert though. And they said, you know, this is fine. Uh, we, we're not super impacted by this. We're not super concerned about this bug. Uh, we, can, we can deal with this for now which then resulted in a couple of days later, uh, some posting on Reddit saying, hey, I think this is getting hacked. Uh, and a couple of days after that, in which the entire organization folded because uh, I believe it was $65 million were drained in the course of a singular day. And over the course of two days, they continued draining wallets and draining over and over. Um, so you're seeing a lot of very, very, complex bugs being executed. But the important thing to realize is the bug that actually caused this, which we're gonna talk about right here, was simplistic. The bug in this case is exactly the bug we talked about earlier. And well, the way we're seeing it is it's calling out to this external address. And if we call out to the external address, what we're going to see is calling is going to result in the ability to have that contract being called. So it, when you're calling things in Solidity, we, we look at elements you can call as contracts. It couldn't just be a person. So if I'm calling a, a function in a different contract, I myself could be a contract myself. Again, it sounds kind of confusing, but you, you take a step back from it and just realize contracts are pieces of codes that are being executed. There's the potential for certain pieces of code to be calling other pieces of code. And based upon how that code is called, various operations can be performed. So potentially speaking, what could occur is if you're calling me a contract and you're a contract, my operation as a contract could be calling you in which you're going to start seeing, hey, we've got this calling, we've got this looping, I'm going back into your function before you've finished execution on mine. That's the basic premise of reentrancy. When the subroutine that's initially running hasn't finished, we're revisiting it and basically abusing that context. So if you're trying to say subtract some funds and I'm going in and saying, well, I'm calling you and performing another withdraw action before you fully process finishing withdrawing my funds, I'm capable of taking money. Now, again, this all sounds super confusing without a concept of how this is all working, but you can read in depth on how this was executed. Uh, I've blogged about it, a number of people have blogged about it, and then go in depth on how this works from a code perspective, how these recursive calls work. Here you can see the person's talking about the specific GitHub issue, and they're testing this specific vulnerability. So we've got you know, a basic statement here saying, it's a terrible attack on wallet contracts, basically leading with, Hey, this is an improperly executed, um, an improperly executed block of code. This seems inconsistent with what I think is right from a security perspective, and uh, 
that's that. We're seeing a vulnerability that's being exploited. It was in fact blogged about, made publicly clear because they didn't have the right security engineers, because they didn't have the right testers, because they had nobody doing a bug bounty, nobody really reported it. Nobody went through with it. This is again, a simple piece of code, but we're talking an organization that had $162 million worth of ether at its disposal, brought to its knees by a single line of code. And, and from a bug bounty perspective, that's I mean, insane. From a bug bounty perspective, we're talking about code that could have brought the entire thing to a halt. So we go back and we realize that a number of tool sets do exist for this. We've come a long way since the DAO. So if you look at how we view reports as quant stamp or from similar audit firms, we're fairly transparent about how we're performing all of these. So many players in the formalized application security space, those that you're probably familiar with, even if you don't know smart contract security, are already getting involved. Groups like NCC Group, uh, Ernst & Young, Trail of Bits have all started looking into this. Trail of Bits, for instance, just released something called Manticore, which is a symbolic execution tool that you're capable of using in order to influence smart contracts. So what you can do is start looking at traditional elements of symbolic execution, like at this point, is it possible for this variable to be a specific value? What happens when this is at runtime? What happens when it's not? Are there any good decompilers except Porosity? TOB has Etherspley. Etherspley for binary ninja is quite good in stack, but there's a number of other ones coming out. I, I will leave it at that. Um, but here we've got, you know, Trail of Bits, which has been a pretty well-known security firm. They've been out since 2012. It's now 2018. So they've been out for six years. And while their focus was not initially smart contract security, they've definitely dove in into it because security here is so paramount. Security effectively drives whether or not individuals go into this space. And as a bug bounty hunter, you can have immediate impact here because security is absolutely critical. It's not something that gets to be a, yeah, you know, we're going to accept that risk. You know, we don't necessarily care about uh, this self cross site scripting or, or something of that nature. It's, it's not something where you'll have anything marked as informative, so to speak, because security is crucial. Uh, security effectively decides whether or not this platform lives or dies. And so being able to bring security to the field here is huge. Um, so as I said, you know, as an individual bug bounty hunter, if you're interested in this field, you're primed to make an impact. And I would say, yeah, go through, look at what Trail of Bits is putting out. They've got Manticore, they've also got uh, Akinda, which is their fuzzing utility, a number of other tool sets exist, uh, Oyente, Mithril, uh, and you can go through these tool sets and look at what they do, and a lot of them are super useful in order to find smart contract security flaws. So here's an example um, of one particular site, I won't mention the site name, uh, in which you're capable of getting you know, fairly large sums of money over finding bug bounties. In this specific case, we had an individual who got 6,560 bucks for you know, finding a validation of external calls. So again, re-entrancy. But you don't have to look any further because BugCrowd already has programs for this. BugCrowd already has entities which are running on BugCrowd and are saying, hey, you know, I want you to be able to look at smart contract security flaws. The Dcash one, I believe there was a payout of $5,000 uh, for finding a vulnerability on their smart contract. And that's huge. Like you can right now look at the smart contracts, get an understanding of how they work, and then you know report it. You can follow the flow you already have looking for relatively easy to sniff out vulnerabilities, but those that are going to be super impactful. The biggest thing here is you need a firm understanding of how Solidity works, how Ethereum works, and how the vulnerabilities in the space work, but there's tons of resources for it. So what you can do is you can take a moment, read, research, figure out how to go and actually find these vulnerabilities and then look through them. This is no different than say, you know, learning how to find web app vulnerabilities by going to the OAuth page. Here you can go to something like DASP, which is the de decentralized application security project made by one of my friends at NCC. You now we can see things like reentrancy, access control, denial of service, bad randomness, 
not a lot of these differ from what we've already seen in the traditional application security space. I mean, access control is something we see every single day in you know, formalized application security. Usually it's more looking at, you know, is this particular entity going to be in compliance with X, Y, or Z? You know, do you, you gate this by OAuth? Do you gate this by checking whether or not someone has a verified admin session cookie or a verified, uh, you know, IP address here? However, it's looking at things like, okay, what's the scoping of this function? Should this function be able to even access this element? When we're talking about the entire code being publicly accessible, we have to be able to consider access control of functions at a much deeper level. If we're writing large applications in this that aren't just token sales, we have to consider access control as well. Here's a fantastic example, the Rubixi vulnerability. So Rubixi was a simplistic contract. Basically what it did is it would go through and it would have a constructor um, and you could play against this game where you could put money in and then depending on how you put money in, you would be capable of sort of guessing um, and, and build, building up this pyramid. Um, but the flaw found in Rubixi, we go, is the constructor function had the wrong name. So contract Rubixi, which was then called dynamic pyramid, this is a simple, simple, simple mistake. Um, because that function is called dynamic pyramid and not Rubixi, uh, I believe it was six ETH were stolen, which at the time was, again, like $5,000. <laughs> so it's, Simplistic mistakes, like the only mistake in this is line 13. So I'll increase the screen size so you can see it. Um, again, not, none of this is inherently really difficult, but it doesn't have a lot of people looking at it. And a lot of people have kind of shied away from it because they're saying, well, this isn't really application security. And I, I would value, it is. It's application security in very, very, very much its infancy though. And you're going to have to start sort of from the bottom. I mean, now we're at the point where we've got tons of tool sets and a number of ways of looking at vulnerabilities that we didn't have previously. And, and that's something we need to consider, like things have changed. But look at the internet back in 2003, back in 2002, where the premise of having like an MS-08067 just wasn't thought of. The idea of just, you know, running through a simplistic uh, environment in which you've got Windows XP was thought of something crazy. And then look at how that changed. It became very simple. You know, 2006 now, 2008, 2012, like when you're moving up in terms of time and you're, you know, still got this age technology, you're gonna see how vulnerabilities become a lot simpler. And that's how we are in this space. The vulnerabilities we're looking at are very simplistic vulnerabilities aren't inherently difficult because there hasn't really been super difficult apps being created, but there's a ton of potential for it. So again, you know, these, these programs are already on bug crowd. So if you're interested in looking at this and you're seeing, yeah, these, these vulnerabilities aren't inherently super difficult, go check them out. I would say digital cash has a pretty good program. Uh, so, so dash is uh, pretty, pretty set, their, their smart contracts are pretty damn good. Um, but you know, if you can find something, report it. That's the ent entire point. That's you know why bug bounty hunting exists. So I would definitely suggest anybody interested in sort of learning more to start looking through these. So I've already mentioned the DAS projects and Trail of Bits, um, but you can look at something like Making Smart Contracts Smarter, which is a fantastic paper, which goes through a lot of these vulnerabilities. It explains in depth how some of the largest vulnerabilities have occurred, things like reentrancy, things like uh, transaction ordering dependence, both very specific -ish issues to um, smart contracts I've talked about here. I say reentrancy is specific-ish because the premise of reentrancy exists inside formalized application or computer security, just general computing logic, but you're not seeing it as widely of a scale. Um, consensus diligence, they've got a great uh, you know, medium in which you can read some of the audits they've done. If you wanna read one of the audits we've recently done, read our inter initial interactive coin offering, 
um, we talk about how you can see far more complex projects. So rather than just looking at the simple uh, like hello world, uh, the int initial interactive coin offering is a way of routinely exchanging a protocol and just going through a crazy amount of steps allowing the people to routinely bid, have that bid change, and um, basically be able to, on a system that is not real time, perform real time trades. So you're seeing technology grow and you're seeing the, the difficulty of these grow. And as we continue onwards, we're going to continue seeing that happening. Um, so you are seeing more difficult contracts with more difficult security considerations. Uh, yeah, uh, the Napstack, there's definitely a lot of good CTFs and, uh, and war games available. If you're interested, uh, the, the Ethernet one from Zeppelin is very good. Um, and there's a number of try to like hack my ETH. Uh, again, this, these are what we saw in very, very early application security days. It's reminiscent of you know, 2003, 2004 for me. Uh, so if you're interested in any of us, uh, our team is super solid. We have AppSec, uh, static analysis, and formal verification experts. We focus a lot on bringing some really good expertise to the space. If you're interested, email me or look more on our site. And uh, gives us about 25-ish, 30 minutes for Q&A. Uh, we can go from there. My email, Telegram, Twitter, all the fun stuff. Awesome. Well, let's see if uh, anyone has questions for you in the chat. Um, yeah, someone, a uh, dude from somewhere was asking about um, kind of purposely made uh, vulnerable applications where you could test on this stuff. Because in uh, like OWASP has WebGoat. Um, yep. and so he was asking about that. But I think you kind of just answered that with your previous. You know, line of yeah, so there's a there's a bunch of test networks uh, as as Mathstack mentioned, like Rapsten. So Rapsten is a test network which is going to have near identical um, compatibility, so to speak, with uh, the the regular uh, main net or regular primary network uh, of Ethereum, in which you're capable of testing whether or not these uh, these actual vulnerabilities exist and whether or not you can go through them. Um, a really good way to test that on these main networks is because you don't have to pay any Ethereum costs or gas costs. So in order to be able to perform certain actions, you have to spend the gas, uh, which is a small amount of money in order to be able to interact with a contract. You don't have to do that when you're interacting on a uh, on one of these networks. Or if you do, there's something called a faucet, which is a way of getting them uh, for cheap. As per the uh, various GitHub links, yeah, I mean, the, the amount of open source research and amount of just publicly accessible information um, on Ethereum and smart contract security is a lot more uh, technical than it usually is in, in non-technical spaces. So you're seeing that there's a decent you know, ability to level up. You're, you're able to go through, learn a bit more with things like oh, uh, OAuth style vulnerabilities. Like there's a lot of really decent documentation on there, but they're simply not for uh, solidity. There's just not for uh, you know, going through and learning, hey, how do I you know, look at reentrancy? Whereas I can find you, you know, a thousand different websites to teach you very simplistic cross-site scripting. All right, let's see if there's anything else that people had. Uh, David Hugh asks, uh, considering he's a total beginner to crypto and smart contracts, where should he start? It looks kind of intense without background knowledge. Yeah, uh, part of that is it, it totally is. It, it is a bit more intense than it frankly should be. Um, but I would say if you're interested in looking at smart contracts, go through and read the Solidity docs. So Solidity uh, is the primary language in which you're seeing most of these written in. And you can go and read the documentation right here. So solidity.readthedocs.io. Uh, it's going to explain how these smart contracts are implemented. Um, and it's for, for context, Solidity as a language is a lot like reading JavaScript. Um, but there's some elements of C and Python, as they mentioned in here. 
uh, statically typed sports inheritance libraries and user types can be defined. So it's, uh, you know, it, it's a difficult language to ramp up just speaking realistically because there is not as much as many resources available as you'd normally see for like an application security or binary exploitation. But there are a number of uh, resources you can find that are, are sort of growing. So here we've got some online, we've got some, there's a number of resources that do exist. Uh, let's see. So I guess continuing that, but then I, I did want to answer um, Lolly Pop's questions uh, as well. But I, I um, only a medic asked a question that I thought was a good jumping off point from, or sorry, mm -hmm. continuation of that previous answer, which was, um, how difficult do you think it is it for someone to move into smart contracts, uh, appsec versus regular appsec? Um, but it just so, going to take some time to make that transition. Yeah, uh, it will definitely make some time, take some time to make that transition. But the one thing I will say is when you're looking at smart contract security, there's a ton of free resources. And that was the part that astounded me the most. Um, when you're looking at say web application security, I mean, you've got Burp and you've got some of these tools which do exist and are very helpful, but you have like, Burp has a community edition and Burp has a professional edition. The professional edition for people starting off, realistically speaking, is just out of reach. Um, you're looking at what, 399 a license, which for someone just starting is, is very expensive. Uh, if you're looking to do binary exploitation, well, you can look at things like Redair uh, and, and some of these other tool sets. If you're wanting to throw something like Ida, um, I can see someone spamming in chat. Lovely. Um, <laughs> I, I, Ida is $3,000. Like, Ida's not cheap. Uh, I mean, you've got Hopper, which is 99 bucks, but like doing binary exploitation on a large scale, it, it just isn't cheap. And while there are resources of it looking through things like GDB, there's not, uh, there's not very good like, entry level resources. And I'd say that is where smart contract security really differs. Uh, so to answer your question, Matt, uh, only a medic, the differences are, it is a lot easier it's just simply because there is um, a deeper level of community involvement in security. While we've definitely got security in a space where people want to be, um, you know, people want to generally have good security. I don't think people inherently want to make insecure code. Um, I think it's security as a whole is sort of more widespread adopted uh, in the smart contract space because people are more actively looking into how they can actively drive security in their projects. I think if you go to the average web developer and you say, now how much do you know about OWASP? The, I don't think many would be able to answer in comparison to if you went to someone who's a solidity developer and said, what do you know about reentrancy? And that's not a mark on modern day web developers, it's more a mark of the field. The field is super invested in security as a whole and people really, really value security. It's effectively what drives uh, you know, the adoption. If, if these things weren't secure, it would be like credit cards in the early stages. I mean, credit cards totally worked and the premise was huge, but if credit cards weren't as secure, I don't think you'd see as widespread adoption. And the difference between like the seventies for credit cards and the eighties for credit cards effectively was security. Uh, great answer. Um, so, uh, Lolly Pog P or Pog uh, P asks questions. Uh, there's a uh, several acronyms in there which I don't uh, recognize, yeah. so I'm not sure what the question I'll, is. Uh, so yeah, yeah, I, I I can answer a bit of that. So, uh, I guess security. can you rephrase the question and then answer it? I guess. Yeah. Um, so there's uh, a number of questions uh, in that, and they're, they're primarily asking about quant stamp, which is where I work. Um, so quant stamp, as, as I've mentioned, is a smart contract security audit firm. And what we do focus on is building out two things. Um, one, the protocol for performing an automated audit. Oh, you can see my, my quip and all those other fun things pull up. Um, and the premise behind an automated audit 
is being able to look at these security vulnerabilities in smart contracts and be able to, you know, responsibly find a way of, you know, saying, hey, this this contract's vulnerable. So if you if you run a security audit through ours, I'll pull up one real quick. Uh, you're capable of seeing. Uh, here's an example. Uh, yep. So we, we warn you, hey. Uh, warning indicates a potential vulnerability. Now that one is known to exist. Uh, and then you can tell us more and read our disclaimer, but let's let's love that. Let's see if there's a number of assertion failures on this specific contract that was put in. So if we read this, we see that there's an assertion failure that when given this balance and this allowance amount, it's it's gonna differ. So we focus on on that, but we also focus on doing manual reports. So this is a lot like hiring. Uh, you know, in the traditional world, you'd see like NCC Group or CrowdStrike or a, a firm which is known for doing uh, secured code verification. We do the same thing. Um, so there's a number of players in the space because a lot of people have realized there's the opportunity for, um, you know, really bringing in uh, secure coding practices. Like the, the idea that we can actually bring in application security initially was just an afterthought, but now it's becoming scope. I mean, you cannot, in these days, uh, run a successful token seller, realistically speaking, launch a product um, without having someone to do a security analysis of it. And that, for me, is awesome. Um, one, because obviously I like being employed. But two, uh, you know, if every startup going through was required to have a level of security analysis performed on their product, I think we'd be so much better off in terms of security. So... Yeah, there's a lot of uh, really big uh, players in the space. There's a number of players that are sort of new and saying they've got all the best stuff, which which is ex that's expected. I mean, we've looked at you know uh, people saying they've got the new the newest Metasploit, or they've you know replaced everything that's being done by uh, you know Veracode, and and that's going to happen um, because you know this is a hot space with a lot of players in it, so it's not surprising, but. Uh, I think the biggest thing is is we routinely, you know, at, at Quantstamp, we're focusing on the tech, and that's been our our greatest benefit. Um, I I had kind of a question around um, this because I've I've noticed that a lot of the people that are getting into blockchain and crypto, like starting companies and whatnot, often they are relatively young. Uh, you know, yep. they're young professionals. I wonder if that is that that's obviously a variable in play here uh, with respect to security. I wonder, I was kind of questioning myself, I wonder if that might mean that they're maybe less secure because they're less experienced. But I also wonder if that might, maybe they're coming into this um, maybe with a better under appreciation of security given that in their lifetime they've been exposed to, uh, especially over the last few years, like the impact of breaches and stuff like that. I just wonder how that kind of impacts the, the community, I guess you could say. Yeah, uh, I may be perhaps the best person to respond to this, uh, given my age. So while I'm our head of security, I'm 22, uh, which is unusual for uh, a CISO slash head of security uh, individual. So it's a, that's a complicated answer. Like I've gone through my life being ingrated in security since as far as I can remember. I mean, I distinctly remember getting banned from Neopets uh, for accidentally phishing someone when I was probably nine. Um, so security has been something that's all we've sort of been seen. Like it, it's been something that's been pervasive in my life and it's been what I've been doing since I turned 12. Uh, I've been running security professionally at many organizations since I was in uh, in middle school, like I, I legitimately had a full time paying job running security since I was legally allowed to work, uh, which is a, a crazy premise, but it's a, it's a fascinating one because the crypto space is allowing individuals uh, to, to really expand. I mean, I have a fairly deep knowledge of a lot of elements of application security. I've been a you know, high ranking application security engineer at companies like Snap, uh, Amazon and uh, NerdWallet. But I've been able to expand my scope a lot more uh, just verging into this space, which is, which is super beneficial because I think people in the crypto space are 
sort of done with the traditional, like, you know, you've got to put in your time on a help desk, you've got to put in your time doing this and that. And we've had this discussion actually really often in the security community on Twitter of, you know, maybe you don't have to go through these steps. Maybe you don't have to do these things. Uh, yeah, that's that's interesting. Um, non uh, Giash, maybe is how you pronounce this username. Sorry if I butchered that. Uh, they asked, um, how much room do you think there is for a full-time job as a Solidity security engineer? Is there a market for something like that right now? And what do you think, if there is or if there will be, what do you think that person, um, that kind of experience that person would need to have? Uh, there's definitely a market for it. I will say we're one of, geez, uh, probably 20 super prominent um, firms for it. I mean, the, the big, the better way of looking at it is do you see a market for cryptocurrencies? And I think if your answer to that is yes, then there is going to be a market for security in it. Because anytime you're talking about, realistically speaking, money, um, the level of understanding you need to have in order to make sure it's secure, especially when it's all digital, is it, huge. So yeah, there is definitely a market for it, especially when it comes to solidity. Um, to have a good security background in, in this space, I would say, you know, learn about formal verification, static analysis, uh, and application security as a whole. Like having a good understanding of SDLC and how to promote it is uh is what we're doing. A lot of people, when I tell them, uh, I remember having this discussion with my mother because she was saying, oh, you know, you're going from uh, securing selfies to securing money, like cryptocurrency money. What, what, like, what are you doing? And I told her like, look, this is, I work at a security firm uh, that happens to focus on, on cryptocurrencies. But at the end of the day, we're still a security firm. I mean, you could run things we're writing against C or Java if you wanted to. Cool. Well, I think that I think we pretty much answered most of the major um, questions yeah. in the chat so far. Um, so I think maybe we'll wrap it up a, a little bit early, if you don't mind. Sounds good, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Jonathan, for your time in this presentation. Of course. Um, please, everyone in the chat, give uh, Jonathan a round of applause or throw in your PogChamp emotes, whatever it is that you want to throw in there in the Twitch chat. And uh, yeah, thank you for Jonathan's time. Of course. Well, thank you so much. As I said, uh, all my details are on the screen now. Just feel free to look me up at uh, Twitter or email me, if, Telegram, if you've got any questions. Thanks so much, everybody. Awesome. Thank you.